Kukuma Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomulekai, leader of Build One South Africa, Musi Maimani, joins me to unpack the party's policies ahead of the crucial 2024 elections. Talk to us about the motivation behind Build One South Africa. I mean, it's firstly in the name, right? I happen to believe that it is possible for us to build a South Africa upon which all citizens, black and white, can live together and prosper together. That can only just be true economically. It has to be made in such a way that we truly do build one South Africa. It must be true politically, because we can't have political parties that still say we're a black party, we're a white party, we're an Indian party, we're a colored party. We need parties that are bound together, that are new South Africans, that bring all South Africans together. And lastly, it must be true socially. And then to a large extent, we've made some progress in that regard as we celebrate our sports, our arts, our culture. But the motivation ultimately from Build One South Africa was to build a political party that gives expression to that. But also, we wanted to be intentional about saying the phase of development that we're in is not a phase of protest. It is a phase of building. It's important that we, we build a government that is capable. It is, it is important that we rebuild, we build infrastructure so that we can keep the lights on and deliver a job in every home. So we are clear that our mission is the now mission, the new South African mission, and the future mission. And we've chosen candidates that have come from communities because we are of the complete view that for democracy to thrive, candidates must be chosen by the communities so that we can give truth to the notion of by the people and for the people. So that's where Build One South Africa comes from. And this will be your first time competing in an election on the ballot since you resigned as the Democratic Alliance leader in 2019. Mm -hmm. So how much support are you aiming for in this year's elections? Yeah, we're feeling strong, you know. When we set out, we wanted to get above uh, 5%. We think that it's still possible. We want to grow. We want to be uh, in the top four parties in the country, certainly. And we are working towards saying, put us in the room. Put us, because what we know is that there'll be no party that's got an absolute majority which means that we are going to form a grand coalition of the opposition. That's what we've got to look forward to as South Africans. And I know for many people that presents a fear and a worry. They are concerned that their beloved ANC is falling apart. I'm sad about what's happened with the ANC. But I'm clear in my head that it would be good for the ANC to renew itself from the bench rather than trying to say uh, to an alcoholic, let them sober up at the bar. So what we've got to do then is put together this grand coalition. And I'm asking South Africans to put us in the room. Because if polls are to be, you know, believed, we, from a favorability point of view, I certainly sit in the top four or five leaders in the country. And as a party, we're starting to show growth in provinces like the Western Cape case and then Gauteng. So the ask is that at a basic minimum, put us in the room so that we can decide and work with those who share this vision of a South Africa for all, who actually want uh, for us to be able to deliver a job in every home so that we can build a capable government that sets up South Africa's future. And talking about coalitions, Mr. Maimani, which parties would you consider forming a coalition government with and which parties would you stay away from? I'm careful not to be selective about who. Let me rather be selective about what. This is where I'm very, very central. Because we have a 10-point plan. In that 10-point plan, it touches on areas like making sure ESCOM actually works, which means that we've got to introduce SMRs to make sure that ESCOM's base load is in place and reduce demand. We talk about logistics, how to split Transnet into its multiple components so that goods can move in and out of the country and passengers can get to and from work. We talk about educating our kids. Let's move this pass mark from 30% to 50%. Let's make sure our young people are educated for the future. We talk about building of infrastructure, not just road infrastructure, but also broadband infrastructure so that we've got a tech-enabled economy. We talk about keeping our communities safe, and that's about devolving policing to a, low, 
to a, to a, the lowest common part so that intelligence sits on the ground and we're able to effectively identify the criminals and work with the criminal justice system to lock them away, to build the capability of the state by appointing the most ethical leaders and bringing them on point. Now, now if you follow all of that, there are parties that are not going to do that. Let me take just this last point, appointing ethical leaders. If a party brings the corrupt to parliament, you can't work with it. And I'm afraid that excludes the ANC. They are bringing corrupt people to parliament. On the other score, when you say you want to build one South Africa, you can't work with parties that want to hold on to races. Because if parties want to say, we want to only represent this race, this tribe, those conversations must be had. Because the worst thing we could do is create this grand coalition of the opposition and govern West and the ANC. South Africans will never forgive us for that. So we have to govern better and deliver better. Therefore, it's why I, I, I believe the ANC is excluded out of this conversation, but I think we can speak to parties in general and work with how we achieve against that plan. Because what's important is what you are trying to do, not if the what can't be reduced to let us remove the NC and, and the rest will follow. It doesn't, it's not like seek ye first the political kingdom and the rest will follow. The, the world, it can't work like that. We have to have a plan that tells us that we have a vision for this country upon which people will prosper. Talking about corrupt and incapable political leaders, what is your stance on CADA deployment? And what process will you follow to ensure that you have people you trust and people that are capable in key government positions? We have what is called the Public Service Commission, which is uh, an, inst an institution of government set up precisely to prescribe what are the job requirements in each job, in each component uh, institution, uh, SOE, government department. So what we've got to do is strengthen the Public Service Commission so that when the Public Service Commission says, at ESCOM, you need an engineer to be the CEO, you, you can't bring a medical doctor. As qualified a medical doctor is, you can't just say, well, come and also run ESCOM. Because you're going to create a mismatch of skill. So building of capability is also about having an architect of a small and capable government about which portfolios are needed there. Trust cannot be patronage to a political party. Trust must be on competence to deliver the job. That's the only trust I'm interested in. And therefore, we've got to, once we have that infrastructure, that rubric put up on the table, we can go to the best universities in the country, the best institutions, the best skilled South Africans and say, come work for government. So that, as we've seen in countries like Japan and South Korea, the only path out of poverty has been the capability of the government by putting the most competent. You will never meet someone who's in the finance portfolio who is not the equivalent of what is a chartered accountant or beyond that. You have people who have PhDs working as director generals in department. We have to make the ambition for senior leadership in government to be one where the best come in there. And I think we've been very poor at that because of cadre deployment born out of party patronage. We've created these problems of a weakening state. And so you end up with a public protector being weakened. You can end up easily, historically, we've seen the National Prosecuting Authority. We've seen state-owned enterprises become weakened, etc. We also see municipalities become destroyed. So let us restore the capability of the government and hold people to account. Because it's also one thing to put people into positions. It's another to fail to hold them account when you see cabinet ministers who fail, et cetera, et cetera. So let's be clear. Building the best means you have to attract the best, and the best can only be prescribed to you by the Public Service Commission. So that is the only way. You will never, in, in a BOSA government, have a deployment committee, et cetera. The Public Service Commission is quite capable of doing the work of crafting for us what is required in departments. And almost 70% of young people cannot find work in others are trapped in underemployment. So even if given the mandate to govern, how will build one South Africa support economic growth and create jobs? Yeah, I mean, job creation is a function of uh, macroeconomic policy, which, and 
And that is articulated on two pillars, really, the fiscal and the monetary policy. So what I'd like to look at is I often to explain it easier, I say the economy is about, it's like a garden, right? In a garden, you put plants, but you also want the conditions in the garden for those plants to grow. So let's talk about the conditions first. The conditions are keep the lights on. No economy is going to grow without electricity. And I've already spoken to her about what we're going to do. Make sure logistics work. Make sure that communities are safe. But more crucially, educate your young people. When our young people are passing at 30%, of those two out of three young people who are unemployed, we know 90% of them don't have a matric. We know that when someone gets a university grad degree, the unemployment levels are below 10%. We know that actually young people who start school and go to proper ECD centers are able to stay in school for a longer period of time and they can read for meaning by the time they're at the age of 10. So these are important issues that you need to know so that you create uh, the appropriate conditions for growth. So that's the conditional part. And then obviously on your monetary policy, I think it's quite well prescribed in our constitution about inflation targeting as it speaks to the mandate of the South African Reserve Bank. Now, on the plans bit, what things do you want to put in there? I'll pick one as an example. Let's take manufacturing. Our manufacturing input relative to what we need, in, for example, in the manufacturing of kettles. Let me use that. It's an old technology, but all of us use kettles, right? South Africa only manufactures 4% of those. I dealt with a company that used to manufacture John Drake. I don't know if you were old enough to remember John Drake, but these were shoes that were manufactured in KZN. These shoes, how could we have been to get behind this business? And I'm proposing that we create a jobs and justice fund that stimulates these businesses, stimulates manufacturing, offers the tax incentives for people to be able to uh, be able to start their businesses, grow them. I propose a 220 billion rands township economy so that we can build BPO centers in townships so that with internet broadband pro proliferation, mothers and fathers can work closer to home and put a job in every home. And more specifically for young people, I've wanted to introduce a national civilian service so that young people can spend six months interning in government and six months in practical work experience. And we will remunerate them for the whole year, but it gives them practical work experience. When you come up with a combination of those by also looking at sectors that are key contributors to GDP growth, whether those are minerals, et cetera, you can then begin to see, at least by stabilizing <clears throat> the conditions, a 2 to 3% um, GDP growth in the next two, three years, and then the five-year period, making sure we're growing at 5%. The last thing I'd say is, in looking at the SADC region in its collective, if we really want to transition at a bigger level, let's lessen the burden of capital, let's ensure that we can transition from fossil fuel to an environmentally sustainable uh, technologies, and that would be the benefit of using gas and multiple technologies that are not available immediately in South Africa, but they can come from countries like Mozambique and Malawi. And then we can create grids that are able to sustain us. And then lastly, we've already got minerals that are going to be important for battery technology going forward. And so if we are going to use those, given that there are farms not far from us, DRC and many other parts, let's ensure that we can partner together as the SADC region so that we create a growing economy for the continent, given that the biggest population growth that is coming in the next 10, 15 years is going to come principally out of Nigeria and other parts, but we are looking at a population uh, of about 1.4 billion people by 2040. And that's going to be either an opportunity or an existential threat for the continent of Africa. And seven political parties and civil society organizations have joined Build One South Africa in committing to foster significant political change in the country. So tell us about this partnership and are these parties campaigning for Build One South Africa or individually? No, these parties, we've all agreed that we need a shorter ballot paper. You, you can't have a ballot paper of many, many parties. All of them had the capability of being on the ballot by themselves. But in the interest of country and working together, we decided that we would work together and all of us campaign for Build One South Africa so that we share common values, we share common vision, we share resources, and we can ensure that ultimately and across the country, we represent the diversity of South Africans. And there are many more parties that I wanted to come on board. 
And the principal focus there is about ensuring that actually we direct voters towards one tool where people can work together. And lastly, Mr. Maimani, with so many parties, new and old, contesting the elections this year, why should South African voters ultimately put their trust in your party? I think that one, we've asked South Africans to give us their candidates. And they've given us 140 of some of the most talented South Africans I've seen. These are not people I chose. These are the people South Africans chose. And so I'm not asking you to just even vote for Build One South Africa. I'm asking you to vote for the people you've nominated. That's power to the people. Because if those people fail you, you can remove them. Voting for another party is presuming that if those people don't do their job, they are going to be removed. And if history has taught us to the absolute opposite. The second is Build One South Africa has been showing that it is a government in working. And what I mean by that is that it's been where communities have needed water, we've gone out and installed boreholes and made sure people can have water. Where, where businesses have been struggling, I worked with a business and made sure that they can work within uh, their value chain and we've helped build that business. Where young people were struggling with maths and science even during COVID, we introduced applications that helped them catch up. So we are government at working. We've shown that these things we've been able to pilot. And then lastly, I myself personally, you know, they say in life you need to have tasted victory and tasted defeat. You need to know the highs and the lows. As a leader, you need to develop yourself to make sure that you are better as a human being. And having spent time in parliament and leaving parliament, spending time now in the private sector, learning how jobs are actually created, learning what pains business faces up to, and then leaving that and having been involved in church and religious societies, but also having spent some time in academia, now about to complete a PhD in local government economics, I feel I come back better. No one, no one is ever perfect for the role of leadership. I'm merely asking South Africans to say, it's time for change. It's time to trust a new crop of leaders who have a set of skills that we can show. No one is going to arrive with a perfect alternative. That would be a lie. In fact, President Mandela's cabinet consisted of young people. Mr. Manuel, who was the finance minister at the time, these were people in their early 40s, Tito Mboweni and many others. We look at them today as 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds, but we forget that 30 years ago, these were young people relatively. Not young as in 18 and 19, because I think that might be a bit of a challenge but young as in 40s and are still concerned. You know, well, the reason I want to stand now at 44 is because I also think that my kids, my children are, are young. If I don't fix education, my children will be affected. If I don't fix higher education, my children won't have universities. If I don't fix the crime, my two girls run the risk of being raped or being in danger in society. So maybe it's not, it's not as selfish, but it's also thinking about all the young women in South Africa, all the young boys who are, who are going around to make sure that they can, we can build a safe society. So the reason I'm asking South Africans is to say, it's time for change. Give us an opportunity to be able to take this country forward for we bring the skills that can bring South Africans together for the future. That was Musi Maimani speaking to Krima Media's policy about the party's policies ahead of the crucial 2024 elections.